Hello and welcome. I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and welcome to the Marian Eucharistic Virtual Conference, where I'm going to be speaking about building a Catholic culture, setting the record straight. You know, uh, our Lord told St. Faustina, he said in one of his visions to her, my daughter, I want to teach you about spiritual warfare. Never trust in yourself, but abandon yourself totally to my will. In desolation, darkness, and various doubts, have recourse to me. What a beautiful lesson for all of us, huh? He goes on to say, do not fear struggle. Courage itself often intimidates temptations, and they dare not attack us. Always fight with the deep conviction that I am with you. I will not delude you with prospects of peace and consolations. On the contrary, prepare for great battles. Oh, come on now. I mean, that, that's the language that Jesus is still speaking to us today. I am with you. Be prepared for spiritual warfare. Be prepared for battles. I've not, you think I've come to, to bring peace and consolation? No. Get ready to fight because the devil is a liar. He goes on. Know that you are now on a great stage where all heaven and earth are watching you. Fight like a knight so that I can reward you. Do not be unduly fearful because you are not alone. You know, how beautiful the words of our Lord are, especially in this time of COVID-19 pandemic and all the natural disasters that are happening around the world, the, 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 in my part of the world, the, the fires and all the smoke in the Pacific Northwest, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, um, it's just been unbelievable. And plus the year that we've been having uh, in, in our country with the race uh, riots and just everything, it's just, you know, it's just been a, a very unsettling time that has filled many people with fear, with anxiety. Jesus tells us though that foxes have holes and birds in the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He is saying that the work of evangelization, of sharing the good news of our faith in love, is never easy and it's never finished. We cannot rest while the storms of war and poverty and COVID-19 pandemics, people losing their jobs, not being able to go to mass, not being able to receive the Eucharist and confession on a regular basis. Um, you know, um, uh, the the rioting and the looting and the vandalism and uh, all the things that are happening around the world, the increase in internet pornography, the increase in domestic violence as a result of COVID-19. We cannot allow that instability to shake us violently as the tempest of disease and corruption and unspeakable crimes against the culture of life rage all around us. How should we respond to this? Should we be frightened and unsettled? Should we panic as we listen to political pundits and business analysts and self-assured politicians who sound like prophets of doom? Or should we instead be like Jesus and deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him to glory? Remember he says, I am with you. And he promised us when he ascended to heaven, I am with you always until the end of the age. So yes, sometimes it feels that God is not here. We see all the craziness going on around us. Oh, but he is very much here and he is with us and he is making his uh, presence known and felt all around the world. Because we live in a culture that has forgotten about God. We've put God to the margins. We've pushed God to the side. We think that we can live our lives without God. Now in the Old Testament, when that happens, God says, I love you. You know, I, I want to be in covenant relationship with you. I want to put you under my protection. But when you choose none of those things, you don't choose covenant, you choose yourself. 
You don't want to put, be put under my protection. I'm not going to be able to protect you from what's waiting for you out there. So what happened? They were enslaved by Babylon. The Israelites were enslaved by the Assyrians. They were enslaved by Egypt. And not because God punished. I mean, they said God punished. No, they chose, freely chose, not to be under God's protection. And when you choose not to be under God's protection, we're not going to be protected from the things of this world. And God, again, once again, because we think we know better than God, he's reminding us that he is still here, that we still, still need his loving embrace, and we need his protection. So we should have confidence when we speak the truth in love about the things that are happening in our world, that God has our back. Those who live in the presence of God have nothing to fear. When we become overwhelmed by the trials and tribulations of life, we must have unwavering faith in God the Father so he can pour out us a spirit of freedom, a spirit of love that casts out all fear, a spirit of love that removes all doubt and eliminates all obstacles from us being true followers of Christ. This process of evangelization can only begin when the desire and longing for intimate communion with God is reawakened in us, leading us from the slavery of sin to life in Jesus Christ. You know, the culture wants to say that, you know, you Catholics following rules and commandments and regulations and moral codes and Bibles, that enslaves you. Freedom is doing whatever I want to do. That's where we're freedom, we're, we're, where, we're, where, where real freedom comes from. That's not freedom. That's license. Freedom is freedom in God, freedom for God. When we align ourselves with the truth of our faith, we're actually being free to be the person who God created us to be. That's true freedom. When we recognize and respond to the voice of the Lord calling us, that we will have the courage to speak out against the evils of abortion, euthanasia, human cloning, embryonic stem cell research, and defend the right to life from the moment of conception until natural death. We will set our hand on the plow. We will safeguard and promote family life by supporting monogamous marriage between one man and one woman and denounce contraception and cohabitation. When we boldly proclaim the kingdom of God, we'll protect the freedom of parents to educate their children as they see fit and the right to exercise a well-formed conscience, not the conscience of uh, diversity, but the conscience of truth rooted in Christ. We'll protect our youth from substance abuse, pornography, and other forms of modern slavery, human trafficking, and reestablish the holy family as the model of family life. Here is the truth that God created and loves each and every one of us made in his image and likeness. And so we're going to talk about several issues that are important uh, in our culture right now. And we're going to talk about them from the perspective of our, of our Catholic faith. And remember that the, the principle here, and I'm going to return to this several times, during this presentation. We love everyone, but we always don't love their actions. And we judge actions, we never judge people. That's the Catholic principle and the Catholic way of thinking about things. So first of all, let's talk about marriage, or as I like to say, matrimony, uh, which is a better word to use because it, you know, they've already, we've already lost the word marriage. So I like to use the word matrimony. And I want to tell this, uh, talk about this in the context, actually, of a real life situation that that happened to me and one of my brother deacons. I was um, uh, visiting one of my uh, brother deacons who had moved up from uh, from my diocese north into the archdiocese of Seattle. Uh, I wanted to be closer to uh, to the grandkids, and I was and I had not seen him for quite some time. So we we're having lunch together, and we were talking about what life was like at his new parish. And at one point in the conversation, we got to talking about what music was like in his new parish. And so a waitress, not our waitress, but a waitress from another table overheard our conversation. She came over 
and she was wearing a wooden cross, not a crucifix, but a, but a, a, a pretty good sized wooden cross, very noticeable. Uh, and so she goes, uh, I didn't mean to eavesdrop on your conversation, but I heard you guys talking about music. Are you guys musicians? And my brother Deacon Jack says, uh, no, we're not. We're actually deacons in the Catholic church. And, um, and so he made some small talk and he saw the wooden cross. He goes, oh, I, I, I see you're wearing a cross. Are you Catholic? And she goes, no, no, no. I used to be Catholic. I grew up in Texas and then my parents split and I was living with my mother and that didn't work out. So I moved here with my father. My father doesn't go to church and I really don't go to church. And so Deacon Jack invited her to come to his parish, which wasn't too far from where we were having lunch. And she, and she very politely nodded her, oh, thank you, thank you. And then she paused and then she said this, um, can I ask you guys a question? What do you think about gay marriage? Now at this point, my brother Deacon Jack, uh, who had done all the talking up to this point, takes a sip of his coffee and looks at me like, your turn, right? <laughs> and so this is what I said to her. So I said, I, without yelling or screaming or getting all emotional, I simply said, okay, what does marriage actually mean? Like, literally, like, what does the word mean? And so I explained to her that marriage comes from matrimony, matri monium in Latin. Matri is a derivative of the word mater, which means mother. And monium is a suffix ending in Latin, which means the state or condition of something. So literally, marriage, matrimony, literally means the state or condition of motherhood. So if you want to redefine marriage, you have to literally change what those words mean. So who has a right to change what words actually mean. Who has the right to do that? So for example, my name is Deacon Harold. Um, Deacon comes from the word diaconia, which means servant. And Harold comes from old, the old English word herabald. Uh, like for example, if you look in Beowulf, right? You see that name in there. It means mighty in battle. So my name literally means the servant who is mighty in battle. That's literally what Deacon Harold means. So what if someone were to come along and say, well, you know what? It no longer means that it means parked across the street. Who, who has the right to tell me that the objective, uh, the objective meaning of my name means a servant who is mighty in battle and the subjective truth comes in. Well, I don't want to mean that anymore. I want it to mean something else. It will now mean this. Now, who has a right to do that? So what basically what the Supreme Court did was they, they held up a glass of water and they said, what is this? And everybody said, water. And they said, no, that's soda. And everybody's looking like, well, it kind of looks like water. And, and the Supreme Court basically said, well, what you thought was water from time and eternity I am now redefining and telling you that it's no longer water, it is soda. What is this? And everybody said, soda, including people in the church. See, that's what happens when we keep our mouth shut, when we just come into Sunday at Mass and just punch the clock every Sunday, when we don't really live a Eucharistic faith in the world and we expect everything to change. Somehow, magically, everything's going to change. You know, there was a song uh, that I sung in church when I was a kid, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. If we want to change the things of our culture, it has to start with us. Who's going to do it? Jesus, well, Jesus is going to do it. Jesus left us. He ascended into heaven and left us here to fulfill and to do, continue to do his work on earth. So like I said, we, there's nothing to be afraid of because he is with us. He knows we're going to be persecuted because that happened to him. And the early martyrs of the church, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, all those beautiful women in the Roman canon who'd rather die than deny Jesus Christ. And we want to deny Jesus in our culture up one side and down the other. See, here's what's happening. Instead of being made in the image and likeness of God, 
We're trying to remake God into our own image and likeness. That's exactly what's happening in our culture today. But anyway, to continue my conversation with the waitress. So after I explained to her what matrimony, I said, who has the right to change uh, you know, what, what uh, marriage actually is? Change what the words actually mean. So I went on to say that marriage has always been understood to be a relationship between one man and one woman and any children they have together, which is the heart, the core, the center, the foundation, the nucleus of civilization, culture, and society. Ever since the beginning of recorded history, 6,000 years, marriage is always understood to be that way. And there have been structures within society that have supported that relationship. Um, for example, the United States, the way the tax laws are written, how they favor a married couple over, for example, a single uh, person who's, who's not married. Why? Because of what that relationship does for everyone in culture and society, not just for the individual people involved. That's why marriage has been protected and defended the way it has been for so many years and for so many, so many centuries. What our culture has done today, they want to take marriage to no longer mean husbands, wives, and children. Instead, it means uh, two people who love each other. Notice in that definition, no husbands, no father, no children. What does that mean? No future. No future. That's a relationship where people are just, you know, um, uh, are just focused on themselves. What benefit does that relationship have to everyone else in the culture? None. The only ones that benefit are those two people involved in the relationship. And here's the sad part. It's not even that relationship. It's not even a relationship between two people. It could be a man and a man or a woman and a woman. That's not even where we are today. We're beyond that now. Just take a look at some examples. You know, and, and this is biblical. In Genesis 2, verses 18 to 20, remember God tried to find a helpmate for the man, a uh, uh, Zeta Konegdo in Hebrew. Um, uh, and he tried to, first he tried to bring all the animals. And at the end, he said there was not a helper fit for him from all the animals. So he created her, his wife, his bride from his side. But he brought all the animals first and none of the animals were, and we're doing the same thing today, except in a different way. So for example, a woman in France attempted to marry a bridge. You know that cars drive over? And the mayor of the town so-called officiated at the ceremony. A woman in Seattle tried to marry her apartment building, her flat. Uh, there's a huge trend in sologamy, for example, um, people marrying themselves. That was in Missouri a few years back. A woman attempted to marry herself. You know, I wonder what arguments are like in that family. A man in Japan spent $18,000 to so-called marry a hologram. A hologram, something that's not even real. A woman on live television attempted to marry her dog. She was in a wedding dress. The dog was in a tux. And she attempted to marry the dog on live television. Uh, a woman so-called marries a 90-year-old chandelier. And a, another man in Japan attempted to marry his pillow. His pillow. See, see what's happening here? We're mocking God up one side and down the other. And do we think that God is just going to sit back and allow himself to be mocked? No. God is showing us right now that he is real and we need to pay attention to the signs of the times of what's going on in, in our culture. We need to set the record straight. We, and, and what does it say in the scriptures? Let us put things right. Uh, let us put things right. Let us uh, uh, attempt to wrong, uh, to right the wrongs that have happened uh, to our culture and have affected all, every single one of us in different ways. I went on to explain to her that, um, that, so, that the, so the government has no right to interfere with anyone's personal lifestyle choice decision. The government is supposed to intervene for, for things and, and change laws that 
are for the good of everyone. So for example, when I was a kid, there was no seatbelt law. You know, I remember my brothers and I rustling around roughhousing the back of our parent station wagon and there were no seatbelt laws. Now there are seatbelt laws. Why? And which, are, which are government imposed laws. Because when you wear a seatbelt, your chances of surviving an accident are greatly increased. And because surviving an accident and living is actually a good thing, it's good for everyone, right? So that they said, we're gonna mandate wearing seatbelts. That is something that's for the common good. Uh, drinking and driving laws, or mother against drunk driving laws passed. And um, they passed stricter laws against drinking and driving. That's for the good of everyone, not just for specific individuals. You know, and, and when uh, our government gets involved in making decisions that only involve a few people, it always, they always make a mistake. For example, 1857, the Dred Scott versus John F. Sanford Supreme Court decision that said that black people were property and not human beings. That was to benefit a group of slave owners, not for the benefit of everyone. 1973, Roe versus Wade, abortion, on, on demand through all nine months of pregnancy. That is something that was passed for a specific group of people, not for the common good. And the same thing has happened with the Obergefell decision with regard to marriage. So I said that this is an, ex this is an extremely important point because we live in a culture today that says that equality and sameness are identical. Expressing in itself in that sentiment in order to be equal, you have to be the same. This fails the litmus test, since there exists within the complementarity of man and woman a fundamental and intrinsic unity. In other words, men and women are equal in dignity, but are different physically, emotionally, spiritually. These are gifts from God that are unique and special to men and women and they complement and perfect the gifts of each other. In other words, because we are different, because that's, how, what a bit, uh, that's what enables us to have equality. It's precisely because of our differences that we're able to have equality. See, because of our, not because of our sameness, because of our difference. That's something that's written into the very nature of who we are. So then she started to make a series of objections. Her first one was, well, people have a right to have children. And I had to stop her right there. I said, hold on, children are not bargaining chips uh, that people have rights to. What children have a right to is a mother and a father to be known and to love, be loved by their own mother and father. Because what is she trying to say? Well, Mothers don't matter, fathers don't matter, so everything is reduced to a Beatles song. All we need is love. Hmm? And what, that, what does that do? It waters down the meaning of God's love. In fact, it's not, God's love is nowhere even seen in that equation. Again, we're trying to take love and define it for ourselves, and we turn it into virtual, virtual, uh, virtue signal, signaling slogans, right? Love wins, love is love. So I explained to her, uh, so she goes, she goes, well, they could do in vitro. I'm like, oh, and I said, hold on. Do you even know what in vitro fertilization is? Well, that's when you like, um, you know, you, you make embryos. I said, let me, let me explain to you how it works. First of all, you need to know some basic science. When a girl is born, she has all the eggs in her ovaries that she will have for her entire life on the day that she's born. Her body produces no more eggs than what she is born with, and there's millions of them, all right? When she becomes, uh, when she is old enough, she reaches puberty and her period begins, one egg is released. If the egg is not fertilized within 48 hours or so, it washes out with the next period. And that cycle continues every month until she hits menopause, all right? So what in vitro fertilization does, it extracts some of the eggs from the ovaries and puts them into a dish, they get a sample from a man that may or may not be her husband, and they unite the sperm and the egg, and they create babies. Now, you can call them zygotes, blastocysts, embryos, you know, call them whatever you want. 
they're basically human beings at an earlier stage of development. We have names for human beings at all stages of development, right? We have infants, toddlers, what's, what's a new one now? Tweens, teenagers, young adults, middle age, old. And we have names for preborn children as well, blastigotes, zygotes, cat, whatever you want. They're human beings at an earlier stage of development. They allow that sperm and that egg to get to an eight or 10 cell division. And then they, um, uh, then they take some of those fertilized eggs and put them into the uterus of the woman. What do they do with the rest of them? And she goes, well, they freeze them. I said, they can either cryogenically freeze them to use, to implant into a woman later, or those are also used for genetic experimentation of fetal stem cell research, or they just dump them down the drain because human embryos are not even in the same category as medical waste. Medical waste is treated with more dignity and respect than human lives that can just be dumped down the drain. I said the ones that they implanted into the woman, say three of them take. Now she's having triplets. But wait a minute, she only wanted one child. So now they have to talk about selective reduction. They have to decide which two embryos are gonna die so they can get the child that they think that they deserve. I said, that's not fair, that's not just, and that's not right. To create lives and destroy them so you can get the one that you think you deserve? What about the rights of those other children? What about their right to live and their right to exist? You wanna create them and then use them either to experiment or dump down the drain so you can get the one child you think, and what if that child was born with a birth defect? Now you wanna kill that child. What if the child has blue eyes instead of brown eyes? Now you wanna kill that child. Come on now, you can't, you can't have it both ways. And she goes, well, God, well, God just made, it, made gay people that way. That's just the way God made them. Why can't people accept them? After all, Pope Francis said, you know, uh, don't judge. <sighs> so I had to explain, I said, okay, if that's true, then why did Jesus do any miracles? She said, what? I said, for example, when Jesus came across the man that was born blind he was blind from birth and they, they said rabbi remember the disciples said, rabbi uh who sinned this man uh, or his parents that he was born blind and jesus said that he was not born blind because of anything his parents did it's for the glory of god remember he made the he spit on the ground and made the clay and put him over his eyes and told him to go to, to wash at the pool of siloam so why didn't Jesus, when a guy could say, I'm blind, I'm blind. Why didn't Jesus just say, oh, wait a minute. You were born that way. That's the way the father made you. So this, this, sorry, there's nothing I can do about that. I'm sorry. You were just born that way. Is that what Jesus did? No. Why did he even heal him then? If he was born that way, why did Jesus heal him? Because Jesus was restoring him to the nature from which God intended from the beginning. See, we're still dealing with the effects of original sin. And Jesus was right. It wasn't because of sin, uh, of, the, of what his parents did. We're, we're, because remember, in baptism as, as Catholics, right, the stain of original sin is washed away. But in, in the world, we're still dealing with the effects of original sin. Um, even earthquakes and, and all those kinds of things are all effects of the fall. Because remember, sin disrupts us not just from our relationship with God, but relationship with other people and with nature, all of it's tied together. Um, so yeah, so God never intended people to be born with trisomy 13 or anencephaly or Down syndrome. You know, um, those are, again, those are the effects of original sin in the world. But for us as Catholics, it doesn't matter what condition that child is conceived in, what conditions the child was conceived, whether it's rape or incest, we still look at the dignity of every human person. Remember I said this in the beginning. We love, what's the Catholic principle? We love everyone, but we always don't love their actions. We judge actions, we never judge people. We love everyone with the love of Christ. People who are same-sex attracted, we love you. You are our brothers and sisters. And we don't condemn you. We don't judge you. But we cannot approve of your lifestyle choice, 
decisions or your actions. That's what, and see, the problem is the culture says, well, my sexual uh, preference identifies who I am. That's ridiculous. Who you have sex with defines who you are? That's ridiculous. Then what about priests and nuns hmm? who are living a celibate life to where we're going to be living in heaven? Remember, we're going to be spending eternity, hopefully, with God forever in heaven. There's no sex there. So I will, will I not have an identity? So do priests and nuns on earth have no identity while they're on earth because they're not having sex? We get to heaven where there is no sex because the ultimate fulfillment of sex is life. We're going to be living in the presence of life itself. So there's no need for sex. Do we not have an identity there? Will I not longer be who I am in heaven? That's ridiculous. That's a, look, we can't allow this culture to twist and distort the narrative. We have to stay with the beauty of the truth. Now, um, if scientists were to found um, a genetic propensity toward homosexuality, what would that prove? Like they found a gay gene. There is none, but I'll give it to you. All right, let's say they find one. Everybody's going to say, see, you're just gay by nature. No, no, what does that show? That there's, like the man that was born blind, there's something there that's not supposed to be there. There's something there that's not supposed to be there. Then when Jesus heals the blind man, he restores him to the nature from which he was at the beginning. And if there was a way to, you know, um, you know remove that gene or, or find some cure for that, then, then that's what we should do. You know, because people aren't born that way, right? It's a lot of, there's a lot of complicating sociological factors that may lead to, to same-sex behavior, um, but it's not biological. And even if it was biological, just like the extra chromosome that causes Down syndrome, there's something there that's not supposed to be there. Uh, or else it would be, everybody would be born gay, right? Everybody would be born same-sex attracted. So then she says to me, um, you know, um, well, you keep talking about biology. Biology doesn't matter. Biology doesn't matter. I said, well, actually, it does matter. And I gave her this example. I gave her this example. Um, let's just say that we took all of our same-sex attracted sisters uh, who we love with the love of Christ. We put them on an island. Then 50,000 miles away, take all of our same-sex attracted brothers who we love in Christ, and we put them on an island. And then 50,000 miles away, put the other, you know, 90, 90%, 98% of the uh, heterosexual community and put them on an island. If we come back in 200 years, who's still going to be here? So actually, biology does matter, right? The laws that God have writ has written into our very nature, into our very being, those do matter because that's how we continue our species. That's how we continue to exist. And it's not just like animals who mate with whoever they want. You know, uh, we have an orderness and a structure within society. We have, a, we have a teleology. That means that our lives and the unfolding of our lives in this universe actually means something. There's a direction. There's a purpose. There's a meaning for our existence. Right? And that meaning ultimately will, will be fulfilled in heaven. Everything that happens points us toward our eternal gl glory with God in heaven. And now during this life, though, all of us will have crosses and burdens to carry. Some will be same-sex attracted. And instead of seeing that as a cross that, that has to be born, um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, and it's difficult. Uh, the, the culture says, no, 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 you, you just, that, it's not a cross. It's just, it's who you are. It's who you are. That is a lie. That is a lie. And I know there are parents out there that are struggling, your, your children, maybe same-sex attracted, you're just heartbroken and devastated, you know? And, and I, 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 you know, I feel you, um, you know, I sympathize with you. Um, and, and that's a very heavy cross to, to carry. And there may be varied reasons why your child uh, feels that way, is trying to express him or herself that way. But, you know, one of the people I would, I would turn you toward would be a Vera Maria Santo amazing woman of God. Um, this young woman who is same-sex attracted, uh, but she's living the beauty and, and fidelity and faithfulness to the church's teaching. Again, her name is Avera Maria Santos. She's phenomenal. Highly recommend you go to her uh, blog or you look at her YouTube videos so you can understand 
um, I, you know, what it's like, because she speaks from her experience, but also the courage it takes to actually live the church's teaching in this area. And she, then, she, then the waitress, <coughs> excuse me, then the waitress said, um, well, everybody uh, should have their rights. I mean, you're black, you know, and, and your people fought for their rights. These people are just trying to fight for their rights. I said, hold on, hold on, apples and oranges here. Um, I said, being black is not a personal lifestyle choice decision. You know, being black doesn't change the definition of marriage between one man and one woman and the children they have together, which is the heart, the core, the center of civilization, culture, and society. Being black doesn't change that. You know, so no, it, it, it's not, that's not the right argument. So, um, so, she, so at the end, uh, we agreed to disagree. <laughs> okay, we agreed to disagree. And so she left. And Deacon Jack and I had, you know, was talking about what just happened, you know, and, and the exchange that we had. And again, my goal was not to try to change her mind, you know, it was just to have a conversation. You know, so, sometimes you make the mistake of thinking, oh, unless I can convince this person, I'm not being effective. Don't worry about trying to convince them. Just make uh, uh, the, preach the truth and faith, uh, the, the faith and love, the truth from your heart, you know, rooted in the teachings of the Catholic faith and let, and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. You know, so what happened was we were going to leave. We had paid. And before we left, I said, you know what? Let me go say something to her. Let me, let me just go talk to her for, for a minute. So I found her and I said to her, you know what? Um, I just want to say thank you. You know, often when I talk about this issue with people, they get very angry. Um, they start calling me nasty names. And, uh, but you didn't do that. You were very respectful. And I just want to thank you. And I went to shake her hand. And she shook my hand. She goes, you know what? You're the first Catholic that I've spoken to about this issue that didn't go ballistic. Then she turns to my brother, Deacon Jack, and she asks for directions to his parish. You know, that's the truth in love. Because, and she was young. She's probably in her 20s. You know, and that's what young people desire. They desire truth. And we, we, we're afraid to preach that truth, and we wonder why they leave the church. And you're left saying to yourself, I don't understand. They went to Catholic school. They got confirmed. They went to mass with us every Sunday. I don't know what happened. Well, your child became a fan of Jesus, not a follower. You know, because they, uh, they learn stuff about their faith, but they don't know who Jesus is in their life. There's a serious disconnect between the faith and the everyday lived experience. And, and, and they go off to college, who, again, college are teaching these kids not how to think, but what to think. So they're being basically indoctrinated into moral relativism, into a dictatorship of relativism. And that is starting uh, even before even so-called Catholic uh, schools are often, uh, or some, I said not often, but some are not teaching the Catholic faith because the teachers themselves aren't living the Catholic faith. They don't believe the Catholic faith. They're there to get a paycheck. You know, so, so we have to be careful. You know, I personally would not send uh, a, my child to a school like that because all I'm doing is paying for a very expensive public school. You know, it's better to send a public school where they have to actually defend their faith than to, than to get their faith destroyed uh, in an institution that's not teaching what we believe. So what does marriage, why is marriage between a man and woman a good thing? Um, and, and, and what does that do for everyone in, in society? First of all, it creates children, right? <laughs> marriage encourages an adequate replacement birth rate resulting in enough productive citizens to contribute to society and to provide security for the elderly, right? That's a benefit for everyone in culture and society. It creates the best environment to raise children. You know, children raised with both parents in the home are six times less likely to commit suicide, half as likely to become pregnant out of wedlock, and less likely to drop out of high school when they have two parents at home. Having a nuclear family, fathers, mothers, and children, lowers crime, poverty, welfare, which reduce government spending and deficits. Um, children in homes without married mothers and fathers are seven times more likely to live in poverty, half as likely to commit crime. Uh, those with parents in the home are stronger academically and socially, they are healthier physically and emotionally when they reach adulthood. 
again, what benefits does the re redefining, or really with that redefining, they're undefining marriage. What, what, what benefits society do, do they bring? None, zero. Everyone benefits from the fruits of marriage, even those who don't get married. Marriage and family are of a public interest. They are the fundamental nucleus of society and should be recognized and protected as such. So-called alternative lifestyles are personal, private matters, and public authority should not be involved in someone's private choice. Those unions are a result of private behavior and should remain on the private level, period. Now, what about transgenderism, which is another issue we're dealing with in our culture today? You know, um, the Supreme Court recently refused to block a transgender inmate in Ohio from getting gender confirmation surgery. Um, the court's brief order let stand a 2019 ruling by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. They denied the request from the state of Idaho to put the surgery of a man on hold. Um, only two justices, Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, said that they would have granted the request to stay the ruling of the Ninth Circuit Court. So basically what's happening, there's a prison inmate in Ohio who's a man who says he's a woman, and um, the state was saying, no, you know, you've been diagnosed with a mental disorder, we should treat that instead of going through this surgery because there's health, physically nothing wrong with you. Um, you know, you're destroying healthy parts of the body because you've been diagnosed with, with gender dysphoria. And the court said no. Uh, so again, uh, here, here we go. The, uh, again, the court's trying to redefine or undefine human sexuality. So just a little bit of background. This inmate is a man who has been in custody of the Idaho Department of Corrections for about eight or nine years. He was clinically diagnosed with gender dysphoria by a corrections psychiatrist and a psychologist confirmed the decision um, several months into the incarceration. So three years later, the prison psychiatrist denied his request for surgery and he sued the state. So he goes, I want surgery to become a woman. He goes, well, no, you're not a woman, you're actually a man, but you have gender dysphoria, let's work on treating that. And he goes, no, I want surgery to become a woman. And they said no, and so this inmate sued the state. And he won at all the levels, now even at the Supreme Court level. So, um, so this man struggled with his identity as a child and a teenager, and in his mind, in his heart, began living as a woman at the age of 20 or so. Um, he, even though he views himself as a woman, he, and he was incarcerated in a men's prison, of course, because he is a man, even though he thinks he's a woman, he's actually a man. Uh, he was been serving a 10 year prison sentence for abusing a 15 year old boy when he, when he himself was 22, and he's not eligible for parole. Um, and so he was, uh, with, if the surgery goes forward, then he'll be transferred to a woman's prison, even though no matter how much surgery you have, you're still a man. Now, the American Journal of Psychiatry says it got it wrong when it came to analyzing the, number, the numbers of a large study of transgender patients undergoing sex reassignment surgery. So there was a study that came out by the American Journal of Psychiatry that said that uh, they res uh, published the results of a study that found that the surgeries improved the mental health of the people. So if you're, transi you're, you're, you're so-called transitioning from a man to a woman and you get the surgery done so that even though you are still a man, surgery doesn't change what you are, it just changes parts, it doesn't change who you are. Uh, so you, you have the physical parts of a woman that this actually improved the mental health status of the people getting the surgery. But it was recently discovered that, um, that these findings were incorrect and the journal actually retracted its study uh, from the journal um, saying that they took a second look at it and they actually found no improvement at all. See, see, we live in a society, now they're making it illegal 
to even talk to someone when you, if you have gender dysphoria. You know, what they call gender, you know, gender therapy or whatever. When you go to a psychologist, look, I'm a man, I think I'm a woman, I'm diagnosed with gender dysphoria, please help me. They said, no, 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 that's wrong. If, if the person thinks it's a woman, then there's a woman. So, so let, let me tell you where this is leading. We're starting to see things right now, not only with the transgender, but we're also seeing things, for example, people with healthy limbs, like your arm. There's nothing wrong with my arm, but I want to identify with the disabled. And so they're getting their limbs cut off purposely. There's nothing wrong with it, just so they, I, they can identify with the disabled. There's even a, a, a case of a man who's in his 40s who identifies as a baby. So he has a diaper, I guess which his wife changes his diaper and she spoon feeds him and takes care of him like he's a baby. He's a man in his 40s. And he, but he identifies as a baby. Look, these people need help. Look, we are all sinners. We are all broken. We all have crosses to carry. We are all in need of God's mercy and love. There's no question about that. No doubt about that whatsoever. And, and so we need to align ourselves with the beauty of who God created us to be and not allow this culture to dictate who you are. You see, well, this is what happens. When you, when you remove God out of the picture, the culture tries to fill in the blanks. So whatever you think, so for example, when I was a kid, I remember really liking Bugs Bunny. And I remember a few times taking pillows and blankets and making a rabbit hole and eating carrots and then popping my head up, what's up, doc? You know, so if I would have done that as a child and, and I said, I'm, I, I identify as Bugs Bunny and, I, and, and would my mother just allow me to continue like um, now I'm eight, nine, 10, 15. Hey, I'm Bugs Bunny still. I have to identify, oh, come on, please. And I'm not trying to belittle or make fun of the situation. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a serious situation here. You know, but the solution is not allowing you to think whatever you wanna think. You know, your thoughts determine who you are, right? That's, that's new age nonsense, right? That, that's the, um, uh, uh, what's her name, who, who uh, wrote the book um, about your feelings determine who you are, the secret, right? Um, you know, your thoughts determine who you are. Not God, not any moral, natural moral law. Your thoughts determine your reality. You know, and that is a, 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 that's a disease in our culture today. No question or doubt about that. You know, one of the best people on this from, uh, from a faith perspective is Ryan Anderson. He wrote an amazing book, When Harry Became Sally, which I think is kind of the Bible for understanding and responding to transgender as a, as a Catholic community. Um, and he was re responding to this retraction of the study by the, uh, um, uh, by the um, psychology journal, the American Journal of Psychiatry. And he was saying that, yeah, it could be that they made an honest mistake, but I think they realize now that, um, that this, the reality is that this surgery doesn't have, show any improvement at all. In fact, many people that have the surgery, because remember, these are permanent changes that cannot be undone. And when they realize, oh my goodness, and when they actually deal with the gender dysphoria, they actually want to go back to their, the, the sex that they were born with. You know, but now it's too late, so now what do you do? You know, and, what, and what's criminal about all of this is that children who are prepubescent, like a young boy who hasn't reached puberty yet, who's like nine or 10, is identifying as a girl, and they're giving them the, 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 uh, the drugs and, uh, and all that to, 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 you know, to start the process before they hit puberty, before they hit puberty. And when puberty kicks in, and you know, the, the natural changes of the body start to happen, now, they're now being inhibited by these, uh, by these uh, hormones that block that natural development. So they're artificially creating a situation where this child is going to have permanent changes made to their bodies before they even hit puberty and allow the natural processes in their bodies to take place. That's criminal. And in some states, if your child identifies as the other sex and you don't allow the surgery, you don't allow them to, to follow that process, that, you know, child protective services can come in and take the children out of the home because that's child abuse. Now that, that's where we are in our culture right now. Um, you know, a committee in California, state Senate voted not too long ago 
to um, approve a bill for creating a fund for experimental medic medicalized gender transition procedures, including cross-sex hormones and body altering surgeries for minors and legal adults. Um, they claim that to treat gender dysphoria in prepubescent children with puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, that's the way to deal with this thing. You don't need a doctor to know that a child doesn't want to experience puberty will be likely sterile for life. Sterile for life without even have a chance for the processes, the natural processes to work in their body. Um, and then if you don't agree with that, then you're a hater, then you're bigoted, you're intolerant, you don't appreciate diversity and all the names they want to call you and all the things they want, the, the, the slanderous language they want to use against you for actually thinking and not feeling. You know, we live in a society that wants to feel, 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 and we need to start thinking again and not just feeling. You know, when a transgender model and activist, uh, activist male experience, and this is, this is crazy here. So there's an article where this is a man, again, uh, identifying as a woman. He said when he had his first period, he faced both physical and psychological pain. Um, men don't have periods. Men don't have the body parts to, e to even have a period. How could he experience a period? Again, mental here. There's mental issues here. This is a brother and sister that we love with the love of Christ. There's no question or doubt about that. But men can't have periods. It's physically impossible. He, he doesn't know what a period is like. He's not a woman. And, but he said, I didn't believe that having periods would be part of my lived experience. I feel isolated. Everything about periods was tailored to girls, yet me, a boy, was experiencing this and nothing in the world documented that. Of course not, because men don't have periods, period. Oh, then he's upset because there's not um, uh, women's um, uh, hygiene products in men's bathrooms. Uh, you know, he has to shop for uh, women's health products. Where is he even gonna put them? He has no place to put them. I mean, it's, oh, this is, We've, we've completely lost our minds in this culture. And all of this is accepted. They want to accept all of this, but they don't want to accept the, the, the truths of our other faith uh, about the human sexuality as God intended it to be. They don't even have God to be part of the conversation. So um, there was a survey that was put out uh, by the U.S. Transgender Survey reported one in three respondents had at least one negative experience with a health care provider. Of course. Why? You as a man go to a, a doctor and say, I'm having a period. I'm having, and the doctor says, well, I don't know what to do for you. And then you get mad at the doctor? The, the doctor can only treat what he's seeing. I mean, uh, uh, this, is just, this is just crazy. So let's end this section with just a few facts here, okay? People are not born trapped in the body of the wrong sex. That is a complete and utter myth. If transgender were biological, then studies on twins should prove that fact, that statement, that, um, uh, that transgender is biological. Just the opposite, in fact, is true. The largest study of its kind on, on tra transgender uh, twin study in 2013, only 28% of the time did identical twins with 100% of the same DNA exposed to the same parental hormones, identified as transgender, 28%. That means over 70%, um, the reasons for identifying as transgender had nothing to do with biology. 70% of the time had nothing to do with biology. After puberty, 75 to 95% of young children who expressed confusion about their biological sex actually outgrew that. They outgrew it once their natural process of their bodies began to kick in at puberty. 75 to 95% stopped identifying as the opposite sex when puberty kicked in. Medications to treat, so-called treat children with gender dysphoria, as we talked about the hormone and puberty blocking medications, have not been proven safe. No study has been done to show the long-term effects 
of puberty blockers and cross-sex treatment hormones on normally developing children, All right? So once again, um, we have to start living the facts here and learning the facts and understanding, again, our brothers and sisters, but we cannot accept um, people's personal lifestyle choices. We need to give them the help that they need so they become whole and complete persons in their journey, in their relationship with God, because that's the loving thing to do. Telling people the truth is the loving thing to do, even if the truth is difficult to hear. We say it because we love you with the love of Christ. And what does Christ guarantee us about truth? The truth will set you free. Free to be the person who God created and calls you to be. You know, with regarding to um, uh, another topic here, Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood. You know, it's very interesting to me. Everybody wants to cancel things like Christopher Columbus and uh, Unip St. Unipero Serra, and they want to rewrite history and rewrite biology and rewrite marriage and undo this and undo that, but not when it comes to Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger. You know, uh, there was recently an event at a college where they wanted to reinterpret, huh? <laughs> you know, not cancel, not cancel, uh, but reinterpret Margaret Sanger who was the eugenicist founder of Planned Parenthood, who created something called the Negro Project, which targeted black Americans with a birth control agenda. So this workshop was called Reinterpreting Margaret Sanger Through a Black Feminist Lens. Uh, so this was a black abortion rights activist who talked about uh, women walk through anti-abortion protesters at abortion clinics uh, chant Martin Luther King and Margaret Sanger dog their footsteps. And so, uh, how, you know, again, these women who are pro-choice, how embattled they are by, um, you know, by these protests who are standing up for life. And so uh, they want to reinterpret Margaret Sanger through this uh, anti-life uh, anti, uh, lens. Uh, but here's the fact, my friends, Margaret Sanger needs no reinterpreting. She herself openly advocated for eugenics and admittedly met with members of the Ku Klux Klan. And, when, and what uh, the flyer for the workshop for this, uh, at this university doesn't say is that it isn't simply white people who claim that abortion is black genocide. Those who were first called by it, uh, that name were black leaders alive during the very time the agenda was introduced by Planned Parenthood. So what are some Margaret Sanger's own words with this regard? She says, we who advocate birth control lay all our emphasis upon stopping not only the reproduction of the unfit, but upon stopping all reproduction when there is not economic means of providing proper care for those born in health. Eugenics without birth control seems to us a house built upon the sands. It is at the mercy of the rising stream of the unfit. Hmm. So who are these unfit? By the way, I'm gonna give you the sources. Margaret Sanger's Birth Control and Racial Betterment. That's the document. Library of Congress, Google it. Read her own words for yourself. Birth Control and Racial Betterment. Who are these unfit? the Blacks, the Hispanic, the Asians, um, those who are poor, huh? These are the people she's trying, that, that she calls the unfit, that should not be reproducing. She goes on to say, I believe now, immediately, that there should be national sterilization. National sterilization for certain dysgenic types of our population who are, to, are being encouraged to breed and would die out were the government not feeding them. Wow. That is from a personal letter to Catherine Dexter McCormick in 1950. She actually wrote that. That's sick. How about this? We are in a condition of society today where the masses of the unfit, there's her favorite word again, 
have propagated to such an extent that our intelligence is not able to grasp or cope with the conditions so created. We have erected palatial residences for the unfit, for the insane, for the feeble-minded, for those who should have never been born. Now the time has come when we must all join together in stopping at its source, misery, ignorance, delinquency, and crime. This program, this is the program of the birth control movement. The source here is Margaret Sanger's opening speech at the first American birth uh, control conference, New York Plaza Hotel, November 11th and 12th, 1921. Planned Parenthood's allies appear to be distracting the black community from the truth about Planned Parenthood's sordid history. Today, there are coordinated strategies to normalize abortion among women of color and the black community in general. Um, we've seen the work of Live Action News and Lila Rose have documented how Planned Parenthood vowed to fight for more Hollywood portrayals of women of color having abortions. Now, tragically, Planned Parenthood's eugenics agenda seems to be working. The data reveals that abortion disappropriately, disproportionately impacts the black community, violently ending the lives of an estimated 1.7 million black babies over the past decade. In one year, abortion snuffs out between 230 to 260,000 black lives. Black women make up only 13% of the US population, but account for 38% of reported abortions. Black abortions outnumber the top nine leading causes of death for black Americans combined. Estimated black abortion numbers were 24 times greater than homicides committed on black Americans in the same year. That's 236,919 abortions versus 9,860 homicides committed against black Americans. Margaret Sanger, um, you know, had, uh, was a Malthusian eugenist. So Robert Malthus was a 19th century cleric, not Catholic, uh, and professor of political economy, believed that population was a time bomb that was gonna explode on the human race. And so Margaret Sanger adopted some of this Malthusian way of thinking and incorporated it into the Planned Parenthood agenda. Um, Malthus, believed, Malthus believed that if Western civilization was to survive, then the physically unfit, the uh, materially poor, the spiritually diseased, the racially inferior, the mentally incompetent had to be suppressed or isolated or even eliminated if necessary. So despite all of this, Margaret Sanger uh, adapted this way of thinking and incorporated this Malthian eugenics ideology into the way that she uh, organized the Birth Control League, which is the former name of Planned Parenthood. Um, in 1926, the Review, uh, a journal at that time, printed an excerpt of an address that Margaret Sanger gave. In it, she says, it now remains for the US government to set simple, a, a sensible example to the world by offering a bonus or yearly pension to all obviously unfit parents who allow themselves to be sterilized by harmless and scientific means. In this way, the moron and diseased would have no posterity to inherit their unhappy condition. The number of the feeble-minded would decrease and the heavy burdens would be lifted from the shoulders of the fit. You see, you know what else this is called? <laughs> Socialism, communism. That's this kind of thinking. Sanger suggested the answer to poverty and, deg and degradation lay in smaller number of blacks and built on the work of Planned Parenthood and on the ideas and resources of the eugenics movement under the pretense of better health care, family planning. That's the language that they use when they're trying to eliminate an entire race of people as if they were garbage or vermin. 
that's what's going on. Sadly, we also have issues within Holy Mother Church herself. You know, uh, we see what's happening in Germany with the German uh, Archdiocese of Munich and free and freezing last year uh, show that there were a number of Catholics that they're bleeding like like a, you know like a, a an artery that's open and bleeding out. Uh, they show that um, ten thousand and seven hundred and forty four Catholics withdrew from the church in two thousand nineteen. And that was five times higher than the previous record, um, which was set in um, uh, five times higher than 2018. And uh, it was the first time it passed the 10,000 uh, number mark since 1992. So why? Because in Germany, uh, taxes are collected by the government. And so, and those taxes are redistributed based on uh, your faith. So if you're a Catholic, eight to 9% of your income tax goes toward the church. With these numbers of people leaving the church, that means the German church are not getting as much tax money. So what are they doing to fix it? The Vatican uh, suggested better evangelization, more effective ways to evangelize. But I guess that's too much work. So instead what they're trying to do is it trying to create this uh, synod where they're actually trying to change church teachings to, to better fit the culture? They're trying to uh, re-adapt or re-interpret church teachings so that um, people can feel better about themselves and want to stay in the Catholic church. They want the church to look more like the culture instead of transforming the culture with the truth of Christ. Um, in fact, it got so bad uh, so for example, women's ordination, um, giving communion to, any, to anyone, even people who aren't Catholic. You know, um, uh, they're trying to um, uh, do a number. In fact, it got so bad that the Vatican had to come out and say that the synod was not ecclesio ecclesiologically valid. All right. It wasn't even valid things that they were attempting to, to propose and to change. Um, they were casting a series of votes about human sexuality you know, about changing uh, human sexuality and allowing, you know, same sex and trans, all this stuff into the life of the church. Uh, so for example, I'll give you an example. One of the things they were gonna vote on, they're voting on the language that they were gonna include in their final statements. So here's one of the, the languages they're gonna vote on. Fertility is more than the ability to give birth to new life. So for, to be fertile means to be more than just biological um, uh, life, which is only possible in a sexual reunion with a man and a woman. Even same-sex couples and other couples who cannot give birth to a new life have a potential for fertile life. How is that possible? You see, they want, again, they want to they reinterpret, uh, re-envision language to fit their own need. My brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is our true model of holiness, for it is in the crucified Christ that we understand what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God, male and female, he created them. It means embracing the cross that we've been given with love, because it is in the cross that we discover why we exist at all, not in the uh, Supreme Court ruling, not in the educational system, uh, not in, in the, the schools, not in the culture, not on television or social media. In the cross of Jesus Christ that we discover our true identity. Our identity is not defined by the culture. Our identity is defined by our faith in Jesus Christ. In the encounter with Christ, we find our true identity that fulfills the deepest longing and desires of our hearts. Those longing and desires can only be filled by a deep, rich, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not by anything this world has to offer or to give us. So we cannot be fooled by the language of the culture that tries to, to manipulate and change and, and undo the language of the natural moral law and the language of objective morality in, in, in lieu of a, a subjective way of thinking is truth, whatever I decide it to be. Uh, uh, it's again, it's like building a house on sand. It cannot possibly stand up 
to the winds and the storms of, of this culture of, of individualism, where, where my idea of truth is turned in on myself. It's about me, it's not about what's best for everyone. Um, especially in the encounter with the Eucharistic Christ, we receive him in word and sacrament, and then we're called to go forth to be living sacraments to the world. But we can say, because we are male and female made in the image likeness of God, this is my body broken and given for you. This is the blood of the covenant that starts in our family, because the family is the, is the, uh, the, the, the microcosm of society, right? Uh, the family is the first society. It starts there, and this act of self-give, giving ourselves away so we can truly find ourselves in God, that starts in the family, and then from the family travels out to the rest of the, to the, rest of the world, to the rest of our human family. And so we can say, this is my body, and this is my blood broken and given to you first in the family and then to the rest of the world. It's the cross that's the meaning of sacrifice. Why? Because it's the cross that's the meaning of love. So let's not be afraid to pick up our cross and follow Jesus to eternal life. God bless you. Thank you.